Our presentation today is called Closing the Innovation Gap, Reigniting the Spark of Creativity in the Global Economy. And I'd like to go ahead and bring our speakers up. Please join me in welcoming Judy Estrin and our museum CEO, John Holler, to the stage. Hi everyone, good afternoon, welcome to the museum. So glad to have you here. How many people know Judy already? Show of hands. Wow, good, you know, this is great because uh, this means we're introducing some very important ideas to a whole new audience. Um, Judy Estrin is one of those uh, remarkable people who uh, faced high expectations from birth, I think, because the, uh, the accomplishments of her, her mother and father. Thelma, her mother, was a pioneer in biomedical engineering, a professor of computer science at UCLA. Her father, the longtime chair of the computer science department at UCLA, an IEEE fellow, a pioneer of the Whitesack computer system in Israel. Um, I could go on. Uh, but what makes her remarkable is not only that, uh, but she has matched and exceeded those expectations in almost every way throughout her career. She has had one incredible entrepreneurial success after another. She has co-founded a total of seven technology companies in the Valley over the last 20 years. Uh, I just want to hit the highlights of three of them. Bridge Communications, which she founded in 1991, uh, and which 3Com purchased in 1987 for over $200 million. Network Computing Devices, which IPO'd in 1992, uh, and she uh, sold and then went uh, to another launch, a very, very successful launch, which is actually where I got to know Judy, Precept which uh, was an internet uh, video streaming company purchased by Cisco. She became the CTO of Cisco uh, after that. So uh, we'll flash forward to today because she's now the CEO of J-Labs LLC in the Valley. She's a board member of FedEx and Disney. She's been named three times, times to Fortune Magazine's list of the 50 most powerful women in American business. And uh, she's beginning a whole new chapter of her life, both personally and professionally. And one hallmark of that new chapter is this book, which Coray mentioned, Closing the Innovation Gap. Uh, it's for sale outside at the book table. I'd encourage you to pick one up. And uh, you not only set out your own proven recipe for innovation in that book, but you also talk about the state of innovation in the United States. And maybe that's where we should begin. So what is the problem that you're seeking to highlight and talk about? Well, um like all of the companies that I was involved in co-founding, um, the book was not written because I decided to write a book, but I was grabbed by a problem and uh, a passion for trying to communicate that problem. And um, the problem as I see it is not that there is no innovation going on, and I think we, anybody who's in the Valley knows that there's a lot of new things happening but that the innovation, uh, the support for innovation in the country has become much more short-term focused and um, not as deep and broad as it was. And as a result, the opportunity that I had to build my career and the support for entrepreneurship and innovation that existed in the 80s and uh, 90s, um, and even going back to the 50s and 60s, simply does not exist today. And I was struck, I have a son who just finished his first year in college, that he was gonna enter a world that was very different from the world that I built my career in. And I submitted the manuscript, it was last April, so it's gotten even worse um, since that time. And the way, the best way, to, I guess, to describe the problem is we don't just have a budget deficit or a trade deficit, but I believe we have an innovation deficit. And what that means is that we have a lot of innovation that is harvesting the seeds that were planted 10, 20, and 30 years ago, but we are not planting seeds at the same rate that we need to for future generations. And so, um, as I mentioned, we're becoming in increasingly risk-averse and incremental. And the purpose of the book is to uh, try to lay out a framework for talking about innovation 
and, and what, in my opinion, is the gestalt behind innovation, but then also identify uh, that we have a problem, build awareness, and try to um, contribute to the dialogue uh, of how to solve some of these problems. So you, you, there's a specific quote in the book that I really like, which says that innovation starts with a capacity for change. So you're not talking about the science of innovation or the finance of innovation. You're talking about a philosophical uh, grounding for innovation. What do you mean by that? So when I talk, it's, it's interesting because there are a lot of people that when they say innovation, they think a new product, a new idea, a new discovery. And one of the things that I'm trying to communicate in the book is that any new idea or any new product really comes from um, a uh, foundation, what I call, we'll come to this later, but an ecosystem that can support that new idea. That innovation does not exist in a vacuum. And what does innovation mean? It means something new. And you can't have something new unless you have an environment or as an individual have the capacity for change because anything new is gonna come about by thinking about change. And so really innovation is, or the ability to innovate, really is the capacity for change. And without that capacity for change in yourself, in an organization, in the way we educate our kids in the country, we won't have innovation thrive. So you mentioned the innovation ecosystem. Let's talk about that for a little bit because you have a, a specific recipe. You talk about scientists, product developers, business people, service providers, customers uh, in three areas, research, development, and application. So that's, that's an all-encompassing view of this ecosystem. And you compare it to sort of a tidal pool. You talk about when you first saw a tidal pool, you mm -hmm. saw everything that was involved in that. Can you talk about the ecosystem? Yeah, and the, the reason I came up with the notion of an ecosystem is, again, I was trying to fight this notion that a new product comes about in a vacuum. And one of the, one of the areas that we've really um, forgotten about and is in somewhat decay in this country is research and basic science and our appreciation for the need for investing in research and basic science because as the word accountability has become more and more important and I'm not saying that accountability is not important but if you're not willing to invest unless you know the outcome then you end up not being comfortable with research and science because in the end scientific research is about exploration without knowing a specific outcome. So I felt it was very important to try to explain a framework for innovation that um, let people understand that, again, innovation was not just about a product. And I came up with the notion of comparing it to a biological ecosystem, because a biological ecosystem, if it is not in balance, it does not sustain life. And if an innovation ecosystem is not in balance, it won't sustain innovation. So real quickly, there are three communities in the innovation ecosystem. Research, which is about furthering understanding, new discoveries, and probably as important as anything else, training new minds. Because most of the talent in science and technology, they're trained to think critically by being involved in some research project when they are at school. There's the development community, which is about developing new products and services. And then there's the application community, because of a lot of innovation happens when you are applying new products or new services in different ways. And just to give you two quick examples, think of Google. They started as an interesting algorithm in the research community. They spun out, and they were an interesting company that had a search engine in the development community. But the reason why Google is such a phenomenal success is they went on to innovate in the application uh, community with new ways of tying advertising to search and an IT infrastructure that could scale and allow them to be profitable as they grew. So it's very important to think about all three. If you think about our problems with energy and the environment, we need behavioral change in the application community. We need new products that are more energy efficient and lower, lower carbon footprint. And we need research to look at alternative renewable energies and to understand 
our behavior and its impact on the environment. So unless you think of all three of these communities, you don't have balance which can sustain. The, the other part is not just the communities, but in a biological ecosystem, organisms interact with their environment, rain, sunshine, air. In the innovation ecosystem, there are five environmental factors that are the levers that either stifle or encourage innovation, and they are leadership, uh, funding, policy, education, and culture. But the two most important are leadership and culture. Because in the end, if you have the right leadership, you'll end up with the right funding, policy, and education. Um, it's the leader's job to set a vision, to provide resources, to take down the barriers to innovation. But the reason culture is so important is in the end, innovation's bottom up. And so really, you need to establish that culture with a capacity for change. And then the innovation will come from the people um, who are in that culture. Did you, um, what in your experience building one of these wonderful startups that you've been a part of, at what point did all of this begin to appear to you and you say, you know what, there really is a way and a process and some important things to isolate on. Can you talk about that? You know, it's interesting. It, it didn't until um, what, what made all this crystallize in, in, my, in my mind actually came after all of the startups. I think a lot of what we built, a lot of the cultures that we developed um, came from an intuitive sense of what needed to be done. But I, I vividly remember December 2004, I had committed to give a talk at Stanford in January 2005, and it could be on anything I wanted, and I was sitting there and I said, I cannot give another talk on what the next big thing in the internet is. And I thought to myself, I'm gonna, I wanna talk about something different. And I had been worried for several years about the state of innovation, the risk aversity in Silicon Valley, um, and what I was seeing on Wall Street, because I sit on two large boards. I had been through this incredible proxy fight as part of the Disney board. And so I started to think about the problems uh, in innovation, and I put together a presentation that talked about innovation and gardening and drawing analogies to the need to nurture innovation. So it was really after the fact that I started to think back about what had been consistent in my experiences, what is, FedEx and Disney are two completely different companies, but there are some consistent themes between them that I started to pull it all together. And then when I started reading the writing the book, I interviewed over 100 people. And um, through that, kind of uh, went through my own process of innovation on the ideas in terms of just iterating on them to huh. get to this point. So you talk about some core values uh, of the innovation process. And I want to get to those in just a second. But just to follow up on something you said, you talked about the, the decline of the innovation culture in Silicon Valley. And I want to just I want to dwell on that for a moment because many people outside Silicon Valley think of this as the home of innovation mm -hmm. and, and that you couldn't think of a better model for innovation than Silicon Valley and yet you see it, you see the other side of it as well. Can you talk about what it is that makes you think of it in those terms? Um, so this may become a little bit more apparent when we talk about the core values but, um, and, and Silicon Valley is still, I would say, Richer, a richer environment than any place else in the country and certainly any place else in the world. So, um, but it's not good enough. And to, what happened uh, first during the internet bubble, the lead up to the bubble, um, we became uh, way more impatient. It became about uh, what you could make off of a company as opposed to the passion for building and creating. Um, when the bubble burst, the, the, the valley and, and the venture uh, uh, capitalists became way more risk averse. So you, I, I, the valley that I knew and in which I was able to build my career was about building and creating. And unfortunately, I think the bubble not, and when I make these statements, 
It's not every company. It's not every venture capitalist. You can point to people that are still doing it. But overall, we transitioned from valuing building and creating and changing the world to how much money can we make. And when it's nice when the money follows the building and creating, but when it is driven by short-term money, mm -hmm. and this has happened in the country, when it's driven by that short-term greed, it changes the dynamic. And I remember in 2003, I was raising money for one of the packet design spin-outs, and the first time I went to a VC, and they said, we want to see validated customer input before we're going to fund. And I said to them, if it's a validated market, what do you need a startup for? If it's validated, the big companies can play. And so that level of willingness to take risk, willingness to bet on something, has permeated the venture world. And in a lot of cases, entrepreneurs have become more a feeling of entitlement, that we should do something and within two to three years expect to make millions of dollars. And so the, the, the dynamics shifted. And the willingness to fail and failure not being a stigma that used to be such a wonderful thing about the Valley has shifted some, and failure has become more of a mm. black mark on someone's mm. career. Mm. So there's a lot of different things that have changed. Okay. So let's talk about those values. Uh, you talk about five values in the book, and I want to just tick them off and then ask you to go back and take them one by one. So the, the core values of, the, of, the, of, the, of innovation, questioning, risk-taking, openness, patience, and trust. So let's take those one by one. Uh, how about questioning? So um, let me go through them quickly, okay. and let me suggest that if you're, uh, because otherwise I could take the whole time talking about them, and spend a fair amount of time in the book just trying to give examples um, so that people understand. Um, and it seems simplistic, but these really do encompass uh, environments and people that I have experienced that are truly innovative. So questioning everything, all innovation starts with a question. How could this be better? What does the customer need? What if? But it's not just about asking questions and curiosity. It's also about self-assessment because all good innovation needs to have periodic self-assessment. And we've seen so many companies that have done well and then stopped assessing themselves. We as a country in some ways suffered from a lack of self-assessment for a long period of time. But that ability to take a look at what you're doing, wondering if you should change direction, acknowledging if you're wrong, is a critical part of uh, the questioning. How you frame the question is important. If you frame it broadly, you'll, you're more likely to get more disruptive innovation. If you ask a very pointed question, you're going to get incremental innovation. And then, as important is if you're judgmental in the way you ask the question, you won't get innovation. People become defensive and they close up. If you're inquisitive and interested, then you will get. So as a leader, as a board member, as a parent, the tone in which you ask those questions of others and of yourself is very important in terms of encouraging innovation. So the second one is risk. Yes. Um, and ri what does risk mean? Risk is being vulnerable to failure and how you deal with failure. And um, it is very important to, in an innovative environment to, no one wants to fail, but you need to accept the fact that failure and learning from failure are a critical part of innovation because if failure is not acceptable, people won't try something new. And you have to be willing to try and fail and pick yourself up from that, uh, from that failure. The third one is openness, which is about being open to imagine, to share, to collaborate, um, to change, to, to serendipity and surprises. Innovations from penicillin to the ethernet happened because a researcher was willing to look at data that was not in their path and say, ooh, that problem may be more important than the problem I think I'm going after and, and open to change. You have this great phrase you use call, uh, with openness. You call it critical optimism. Right, and that ties in with both the openness and the questioning that most, uh, most innovators um, are critical optimists. They, you have to be optimistic. You have to be passionate and believe that you can get over these ridiculous obstacles and hurdles that seem impossible. But you have to have enough self-doubt and be critical <coughs> enough to do that self-assessment and be open to other people's questions and ideas. And so if you're too
too, uh, too op optimistic and don't have that critical aspect, you'll innovate yourself right into a wall. Um, <laughs> Good. So the, third, the fourth one is patience. Mm -hmm. This is the hardest. Um, but patience in an innovator means tenacity often. Um, and patience is relative. If you're doing a, a, a scientific research, the level of patience you need is different than if you're in a startup company. But patience in leaders and in investors is patience. Give something a chance to grow. Give something a chance to see whether or not it will bear fruits. And the last one is trust, because without trust, you can't be vulnerable to failure, you won't be open, you won't question, and um, trust is not just in yourself, but a trusting environment. And interesting enough, things like uh, the infrastructure of the country, whether it's bankruptcy laws, whether it is uh, education or health care, a safety net are part of the trust which allows you to become an entrepreneur or go start a new company. And um, the thing about these core values is you can't pick one and say, I'm patient, therefore I'm innovative. They, they all go together and they need to be, again, the word in balance. If you have trust without questioning, that's blind faith, and blind faith is not, uh, uh, does not encourage innovation. But probably a more relevant example is it was impatient people who took risks without asking questions without the openness or transparency as to what they were taking risks on that led to the financial crisis last September. And then we lost trust because nobody knew what anybody else's balance sheet looked like. So nobody lent, everything froze up. We as citizens lost trust in our government, lost trust in our business leaders. And unfortunately, the financial situation that we are in now is too perfect a proof point of what happens when those core values get out of whack as opposed to being in balance. So are you, are you ready now to begin talking about it's broken, how do we fix it? What, what's, the, what's the process we use now to try to uh, restore balance in the force, as they might say uh, at Lucas, and, and talk, it's his birthday, by the way, today. Uh, to, to, get, to restore that balance and begin to get these things back into uh, uh, to, to a level at which innovation can start to take okay. place again? So um, I think some things are easy and um, obvious and some things are much harder. Um, so there are certain things we need to do, uh, bring balance into how much we invest in research and the way we allocate funds in research, um, mainly, which is mainly now in academia because um, corporations no longer these days can really afford a lot of research. And um, I think we are doing some of that. We need to bring back respect for science and scientific uh, evidence in this country, and I think we are doing that. We need to uh, relook at our policies and look at the policies and say, do they encourage the core values or discourage the core values? So everything from immigration to tax subsidies to um, how, what we do about education, we really need to be thinking about those policies in light of uh, whether or not they encourage or di discourage uh, innovation. We have to fix our education system because uh, that is really what is going to influence uh, innovation 10, 20, 30 years out. And we have an education system that the last time it was upgraded was when we went from an agricultural society to an uh, industrial society, and we have an education system to churn out assembly line workers. We do not have an education system which is organized around uh, developing young minds to be innovators, and, and we re need to dramatically uh, impact that. But the hardest thing, um, well, and then we need to embrace intelligent risk in the venture community on Wall Street. We need, uh, this is hard, much easier to say than do, but somehow we need to figure out how to get out of this um, over-deterministic focus on quarterly earnings and not placing value on investment in the future. And then I would say the last thing is the hardest thing, which is culturally we have a problem in this country. And the way we measure success is on short-term money and short-term uh, greed. It's interesting because I talk a lot about this in my presentations and I happen to tune into uh, President Obama giving his 
commencement speech at Arizona State University uh, yesterday. And a big part of his message to those students is you have to think about different metrics for success. Because all of our metrics for success for the last couple of decades have been financial and self-serving and short-term. And we have to start educating and bringing up our kids to think about longer-term prosperity. Everybody is, thinks about themselves and their family. But if you think about long-term prosperity, you realize you're interconnected to other people's success. If you're focused on short-term greed, then it's each person for themselves. And we really have gotten into this mode of instant gratification and driven by external incentives, primarily dollars. And um, we've, we have gotten ourselves into a very deep hole as a, as a result. So how we make that cultural shift and whether we can learn from the failure, I don't know. But I'll talk about it till I'm blue in the face. So. <laughs> Do you see this as an opportunity? I mean, this is, a, this is as bottom of bottoming out as we have seen in a very long time. Um, I do see it as an opportunity, but my concern is that um, I, I think that a lot of what we are doing now and have done has been to stop the spiral down, and we kind of will get to the bottom. And we will be at the bottom with two really big problems. We're going to have a massive deficit and very, very significant unemployment. And normal growth will not solve those two problems because the companies that have gone out of business will not rehire their employees. And the companies that have laid off have restructured around a leaner uh, uh, number of people. So how do you solve those two problems? And the only way to solve them is through true dramatic innovation, not incremental innovation in the industries that will continue to go. That'll get us little bits of growth. But we need new industries, not new bubbles, but new industries that can build and sustain. And to, it seems to me there are two opportunities in terms of those industries. One is driven by energy and the environment. And it doesn't mean that uh, technology doesn't have a role to play. It has a huge role to play. But it is uh, interdisciplinary, driven at solving our problems of energy dependence in the environment, or clean tech, as people say. And the second is healthcare. And when I say healthcare, I'm not talking about the, just the delivery of healthcare. I'm talking about medicine. I'm talking about wellness. I'm talking about care for the elderly. So the whole, um, the whole broader definition of healthcare. And those are both significant industries, but both have significant structural issues that create risk and create need for capital, need for IPO markets, that are going to have to embrace them. And um, so I just hope that we, I think we as a valley need to reinvent ourselves. And those of us who are technologists need to think about how do we apply that technology to these big problems that need to be solved so that we can see uh, industries that are equivalent to what happened in the 50s, 60s, 70s with the computer industry and the communications industry. They took off because there was a driving need. And now there are driving needs, and we need to apply those skills to innovate uh, more deeply and broadly. So it sounds like, uh, if you think about these five core values, the two that you've talked about more than any other, and just in listening to you, are patience and trust. Do you think those are the two that got the most out of balance, or the ones that we're maybe we're doing the least to cultivate today? I think that as a uh, um, no, I, I I think risk, patience, and trust, risk, patience, and because patience. the risk changed its per portfolio, and I'm a little nervous that we'll take the wrong lesson out of the financial crisis, in that people will say, "Don't take risks." No, they took the wrong type of risks. They didn't take intelligent risks. And so um, I, I think we, we really need to think about our appetite for um, intelligent risk in terms of being willing to invest in things that we don't know the outcome for. I do think that trust is a really uh, important thing that we lost and we need to rebuild. Again, whether it is trust in the government, trust in businesses, 
trust in ourselves. And one of the things that I uh, feel very strongly about when you talk about leadership styles is that um, there's no question that threats, competition, something like the uh, financial crisis, big problems like the environment, everybody talks about threats inspiring innovation, that competition inspires innovation. You know, Rahm Emanuel says a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. So it is true that threats can inspire innovation, but you need to, to treat it correctly. What happened after 9-11 was that we took a threat, or I shouldn't say we, the leadership took a threat and made people afraid, but did not ask for people to be involved. And so when you scare people, and they are scared and helpless, it actually turns off innovation. And it turns off that leadership or executive function in people's minds. But if you take a threat and you turn that threat into a challenge and you rally people to get involved, then you turn on innovation because innovation is often inspired by grand challenges. So look at what JFK did um, after Sputnik. We didn't just go build a bigger rocket we inspired generations of, of scientists. If you look at the way the uh, leaders choose in businesses, when suddenly you need to lay off, do you go scare your employees and tell them you know, there's gonna be a layoff, or do you get people involved in figuring out how to cut costs? After the financial crisis, a memo ran around Silicon Valley from one of the venture firms that said, uh, rest in peace, the good times are over, everybody needs to lay off, and it created Panic, it created fear in engineers. These companies need to be nurtured, not scared. And so um, we really need to think about, each one of us as a leader, whether you're leading a company or leading your, in your community or leading yourself, about looking at these grand, these threats, these, uh, these problems and translate them into challenges that inspire ourselves and everybody else to innovate. That's, that's really the only way we're gonna uh, get out of this. Right. So when you, you're on the Disney board, you're on the FedEx board, you're very involved in the Valley in so many ways. You're on an advisory committee to the president now looking at technology. When you look across all of these communities that you look out into and you think of the people who are really good at this now or the companies who are really good at this or a sector of the industry in, in practicing this kind of innovation that mm -hmm. you've described, what do you see today? What are the, what are the areas that give you the most hope? Um, so one thing that gives me hope is that I do see, a lot of people think that large companies can't innovate. And the reason I'm on the board of the two companies I'm on is these are two examples of large companies that actually uh, do embrace uh, innovation. And I, I will say Pixar, to me is one of the most innovative environments. Not just do they make, are they creative and do they make great movies, but the environment there fosters innovation um, as much or more than any environment I've ever seen. On the other hand, FedEx, which is a very operate, all about operational excellence, um, is an incredibly innovative uh, company also. So I, I have seen that large companies can innovate if they have the right leadership. Um, although many uh, companies aren't bold enough uh, to do it. Another great example is Apple, of a company that is bold enough to say, I'm going to invest in innovation. Um, in the startup arena, I'm actually more positive right now about uh, the uh, medical devices, uh, kind of life sciences, that the healthcare part seems to be working better and people seem to be taking a little bit more risk than I am the uh, technology and IT sector. Um, there I think that there's, um, I see a lot of incrementalism, I see uh, a lot of risk aversity in terms of uh, people investing. And in the clean tech sector, I am both encouraged that people are so interested and that people want to solve big problems, I'm a little nervous in that I'm afraid that I see a lot of venture people starting to invest. I'm afraid they won't have the patience to see some of those companies through because there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of um, 
uh, structural regulatory issues there, that it's going to take patience. And I hope that they have the patience and that they don't get all excited about it and then dump that segment, because we need that segment to thrive. Right, right. So we're going to start uh, collecting some question cards in just a minute. I just wanted to give you the chance to, uh, to pass your questions up to the front. I've got a couple more, and then we'll, uh, we'll move to the questions. So. Um, you have this interesting quote from John Seeley Brown uh, in, your, in your section about the education system. You spend a lot of time talking about education, and, and John Seeley Brown says, if I had to teach creative problem solving, would I go to mathematics, physics, or engineering? No. I would go to history and art for lessons in moral development. Those are the domains that build the aesthetics and sensibilities for the kind of thinking we need. Now, you could count on me to pick a question that focused on history as an important thing to talk about since we are at a history museum, but I, uh, I wanted to just ask you about why did you pick that particular quote when you think about the education system and where it needs to improve? I think the reason I picked that quote is that um, I, t I do focus in that chapter, and there's a lot of focus in the country, on the need for improving our education when it comes to science, technology, uh, engineering, and math, so s the STEM subjects, and um, I, I'm afraid that we have, uh, first of all, I think the way we have done it with No Child Left Behind was the wrong way to do it, but we, all, we not only have not succeeded in doing what we need to do in terms of um, science and math education, we've actually done it in a way that we are ignoring the arts, we're ignoring vocational skills, we're ignoring uh, history, so we, we've kind of uh, encouraged educators to go all the way to the other direction because of the incentive systems of No Child Left Behind. And one of the things that uh, I think is so true today is that the problems are becoming more and more interdisciplinary, and we need, as whether it's adults or as we educate our kids, to develop critical thinking in interdisciplinary ways. And so we not, need not just to take down the silos between fields of science or between uh, parts of an organization, but between science, technology, and the arts. And I think that we are seeing more and more crossover where certainly technology is influencing the arts, but we're seeing areas where the arts are influencing scientific research and can be used. Think about video games and virtual worlds, which really came from the arts. But those technologies can now be used in scientific research or in education or in testing different things. And so I just think it's really important. And I use the word balance a lot. And after one talk, somebody came up and asked me if I was a Buddhist, because I <laughs> use the term balance so much. Um, but it, it, we, we we tend to just jerk around and, and go so far in each direction that I just loved that quote from John as a way to saying, you know what, all K through 12 education should be broad. It should be broad and we should be developing people that learn how to learn, that are able to collaborate, that are able to think critically across multiple subjects, and then there's a point at which you start specializing. And we need to be very careful with our kids. There's been a couple of books written lately about, um, one of them I think is called Talent is Overrated, and another, there's been books where talk about experience is really important for kids. And I'm nervous that parents are gonna start taking their kids and put them on a track when they're two so that they can develop that experience. To me, as a society, that is the wrong direction, and we need to make sure that our kids are getting the breadth of education to be able to innovate broadly. Okay. So, so we have some amazing questions here. We, uh -oh, we need to have a kind of lightning round of questions okay. because we have... Meaning I should give shorter almost answers. Almost every one of them is good. Okay. Well, no, I just think it's, these, are gonna really, these are really going to... Uh, be provocative, I think. Uh, so here's one. How do you reconcile your belief that there is not enough investment in basic research with the popular idea that technological change is accelerating? Um, there are two completely different things. The reason why technological change is accelerating now is because we so richly invested 
in basic science and research in the 50s and 60s. But we started to decline in the 70s, 80s, and into the 90s. And there were certain areas we continued to invest in, and there was a, a period in, in which we realized we had gone too low in medicine, for instance, and then NIH doubled their budgets over five years. But they did this crazy thing of doubling over five years and then stopping. And research doesn't stop after five years. So everybody built up their labs, and then suddenly there was no funding. Um, and so the, the scarcity, um, when there's, when there's, you want scarcity so people can compete. When you have too much scarcity, people take a safe route to try to get that grant. And so you really need to find that right balance. But actually, the, the rate of technological in, uh, innovation today is actually a proof point that we did something right in the 50s and 60s, because it takes 20 years to see the impact. And I have had people tell me, prove to me that we have a problem today. I can't prove the negative. I can't prove what is not there. But I'm obviously passionate about the fact that we have a problem. Or, and we'll see it in 10, 20 years from now. If several billion dollars worth of stimulus money became available to invest in science and technology, where would you invest? Now, you've been given some choices here, so you may pick one or maybe none of the above. University research, large government labs, venture capital firms, large corporate R&D projects, or where? So I, I would not invent in venture firms or uh, corporate labs, uh, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, they have money to invest. It's just that they don't invest it because the incentives are not there. So it, the government's role is not to um, bail out. The government's, I mean, we have to now, but the government's role is to invest for the good of society because any individual corporation can't invest in basic science because it doesn't return to their short shareholders. So that money should be going into academia, academic research. Some national labs, in general, some of the national labs are innovative. Um, some of the national labs have gotten, uh, get, are a little more closed loop. They don't have the flow of uh, students through that academia does. So I think some combination of um, mainly academia, some national labs, but then I think incentives should be put in place to get venture and corporations to uh, take more risks. And you want, to, uh, you want to spark those markets through policy, not through funding. Mm -hmm. I do not think the venture industry needs a bailout. Okay. They've got plenty of money. They're just not investing it, right? So, excuse me to any VC in the audience. <laughs> you may be one of the good guys. There you go. Since you're talking about global innovation, is there any country or countries that you think exemplify the values and direction that you're discussing here? So it's interesting. Uh, many people, when they see the title of my book, think I'm talking about the gap between the US and other countries. And I'm actually not. Uh, one of the reasons why I, uh, three chapters of the book are a historical perspective that the first chapter talks, out, talks about walking through the Computer History Museum. But um, uh, the gap I'm talking about is the gap between where we were and where we are now, and where we are and what our potential is. But when you, I get often a, asked a lot to compare us to other countries. And I believe, first of all, it's not a zero-sum game. We want everybody in the world to be innovative. But what we don't want is everybody else to be innovative and for us to be weak, because you don't partner well from a position of weakness. You only partner and collaborate well from a position of strength. So we need to have that strength if we even want to be a player, what's more, a leader in the 21st century. So different, I don't think there's any country out there that has a better position than we do. Um, it actually is sad, because uh, if we falter, the global e ecosystem falters, because we play a, such an important role in it. But there are countries out there that do a better job in certain communities. So China is better, for instance, in having a vision and having massive amounts of investment in basic science, because they just decide to do it and do it top down. Um, places like, uh, um, I think it's Denmark, have done a better job in policy 
to encourage renewable energy. So th there are different, uh, different attributes of different uh, countries. We probably have the best overall ability to go from research to development to application. And the only country that I know that even comes close is Israel in terms of having that, those basic core values built into the culture of the country. Interesting. How, if you could change the quarterly profit system, this, this short-termism that you're talking about to reflect the actual cycle of this, this longer-term enterprise you're talking about, how would you do it? Is there a way to, to take the focus off the short term and move it further out? You know, I think the issue is not that if you went to quarterly earnings to yearly earnings that we would be any better. I think that what I jokingly, not, not so jokingly, in the book suggests that if investors when they, they evaluate all these things when they look at a public company. They look at their earnings per share, they look at their return on cash, they have all of these metrics that they use to evaluate a company. Well, if they would also look at the company's, what I say, CFC, not the bad stuff that goes into the air, but capacity for change, that if you would place value on a company's willing to invest in innovation, their their success rate, you can't measure innovation when it's happening, but you can look backward. And you can take 10-year looks backwards and say, how successful has this company been? Does the leadership have an understanding of investing? And if a company CEO stands up and says, you know what, we are going, our earnings per share is gonna be down because we are taking this amount of money and we're investing it for future growth five years from now. If, if you say that today, the stock's gonna tube you would like the investors to look at that statement and say, my God, this is somebody who understands what they need to be doing as a leader. So it's not so much a time frame, it's to use the earnings per share as only one measure of success of a company. And you know, investors out there claim they want growth. Mm -hmm. They're always talking about businesses that aren't high growth business, so the PE is lower, but they don't put their money where their mouth is, and they don't give credit to companies in terms of the, the stock price for those leaders who are bold enough to make investments for the future, even knowing that some of those investments are not going to turn out. Do you see this mindset changing? I mean, you've got some wonderful endorsements of these ideas from Andy Grove, from Vince Cerf, you know, from some other very influential and important people. Do you see this mindset starting to take hold? Broadly? Broadly. Uh, no. No. Um, and, um, but uh, hopefully, um, I, but I hear other people talking about it. I'm not the only per person talking about this mindset. Um, I'm hoping that, again, once we kind of, I, I think we only recently have come out of the shock of the financial crisis. And as we move forward and get into a mode of evaluating what got us there and thinking forward that people will take this into account. But um, I, I, I'm hopeful and optimistic because it's the only way I can be. Because the, the alternative is to uh, think nothing can change and do nothing. So I choose to be optimistic and try to do something about it. You're the critical optimist that you describe I, that's uh, right. I'm the critical in your book. Optimist. All right, so I'm going to give the last couple of questions to the education subject because we have many, many questions about that. Um, the high school dropout rate is 29% now in middle class San Jose. So how do you suggest that we turn this statistic around and if these five core values are really important and need to be instilled in young minds. How do we go about that? Um, I think there's a couple of different things. One is we've got the wrong model. Uh, if, if you think about one of the things I said is that leadership is one of the most important factors. Well, in schools, who are the leaders? The principals and the teachers. And we completely underestimate the role of those people in our children's lives. And we don't pay enough, we don't recruit, talented enough, we need to restructure and rethink the emphasis that we put on the importance of teachers um, and curriculum in terms of keeping kids excited and engaged. And as we've moved to an emphasis of testing, there's no way to 
uh, discourage learning more than having an overemphasis on testing. You need to assess, but if everything is about filling out check sheets, um, kids learn differently, and we need to understand that. We've got uh, unbelievable technology that we can apply. There are wonderful things being done all around the country, and we don't collect the best practices, we don't learn from those best practices, and apply them more globally. So one, we need to think about the way we teach. But I actually think there's another problem, which is we have gotten very focused on every kid is going to go to college. And every kid is going to go to a four-year college, and they're going to go to uh, try to get to a great college. And so what happens is, frankly, there are some kids that either don't want or because of the environment or whatever are not going to go to college. So the goal is set so high that they drop out. And I think we need to be get, having an option of vocational training. Put more emphasis on the fact that a two-year community college is okay. Actually, it's great if you need people who can uh, fix electric cards or build green or, or uh, be a technician in healthcare. There are all sorts of jobs for which you don't have to go to a four-year college. Now, I come from a family, I'm the only one without a PhD, <laughs> so me saying that is very anti with the environment I grew up in, and maybe that's why I feel so strongly about it. But those 29% are more likely to go for a goal that they can achieve. And we, by putting so much focus on this always getting to the next rung and not funding, I think, some of the vocational training, We've given them no option, and so they end up on the streets. We could go on and on, and uh, it would definitely be worth it to go on and on, but uh, we probably should call it into it here. We're very, very lucky to have you come spend an hour with us at lunch. Let me just remind everyone, this is the book, Closing the Innovation Gap. Don't think you've heard it all or read <laughs> it all. You've only, we've only scratched the surface of this wonderful book, really and it's, uh, it's available out in the lobby. So please join me in thanking Judy for being with us today. <laughs>